Um, so we're going we're gonna to kick off the education innovation panel, though. We're actually going to hear from some ideas of some really smart folks in the room, uh, and then we'll come back and, and uh, discuss those as a group. So uh, Skip Oppenheimer is uh, our moderator, and I'll turn it over to Skip. The first speaker? We'll go directly to the first speaker. Excellent. Sonia, you're up. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Sorry, Skip. Took your thunder there. My name is Sonia Galavis. Uh, I teach at Garfield Elementary School. Um, I just want to uh, ask an uptake to that question. So when you, when you were asked how well you think schools are doing right now and to give a grade, I'd like you to think for a second how you would grade yourself on your involvement in our public schools around the valley. So a, a little bit of what I'll get into, and they told me I only had a couple minutes for an introduction, is it is not my job solely to educate our children. It is not the family's job solely to educate the children. It is our job collectively as community and school and family to elevate what we do and educate our children. Let me just start off with that. So um, Garfield Elementary, big old brick building on the corner of Broadway and Boise Avenue. We serve kids from all over the world. We have 24 countries represented in our school. 17 languages are spoken. We're a Title I school, meaning we receive funds for low income. About 80% of our kids qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, it's game on at Garfield, and you all have a standing invitation to come on by. Um, as an educator, and if you know any educators, you realize that we um, are, are hip to creative problem solving. We have to do it all the time in the classroom. But one thing that we pride ourselves at Garfield, a community school in Boise, is doing things differently. So the holy trilogy for me in creating change in school is this trifecta approach of home, school, and community. Community, that's, that's y'all. That's us. And so when we go to change, um, make changes, we have to look at what is that that we need, who are the partners that we need to obtain that. Now some of the partnerships that we have in schools, and schools all over, are a linear partnership where we need donations, or we need a drive, or we need support, or volunteers in one way. And that's very needed and very relevant to where we partner with, you know, with someone in the community and Garfield is the direct recipient of, um, of what is needed. However, if we look at that trilogy approach of how can we involve home and school and community, we're able to do some really amazing things. At Garfield, an example of that is last year we identified transportation was a huge need, is a huge need for our school community. They can't get around to their medical appointments. They can't get around to different places in the valley that they need to go. So we partnered with the Boise Valley Economic Partnership and some very generous donations from Title I Mortgage and some other folks around the valley. And we were able to give Garfield families, dozens of families, bus passes to be able to access the city. That was mutually beneficial for everyone. When families can access our city, they can you know, engage with different entities around the community, and they can also make their own medical appointments, and teachers um, aren't having to shuttle you know, some of our families around. But to uptake that approach, something that's up next for Garfield is a partnership with the Discovery Center of Idaho. We know that there are huge gaps in our STEM workforce. We know that. So how do we close those gaps? So I'm biased towards elementary, those are my people. We know that the gaps are huge, especially in low income, high ethnic minority, and our females. So what we're going to do with the Discovery Center is we are going to tailor an event to uptake how we develop STEM identity in our families and with our kids. Research is showing that STEM identity, science and math identity, is being cemented between ages 10 and 14. So if we are gonna look at our STEM workforce needs and the gaps that exist, we better start investing in our elementary schools. I see you, 30 seconds. We, see, we <laughs> investing in our elementary schools to shift that identity. We need to speak the language of possibility. There's a million reasons why things are hard or partnerships are you know, um, tedious or we don't have the time. 
but there's so many more of why we can, how we speak the language of possibility to our families, and how we get things done together as a community. So with the Discovery Center, this isn't just like Garfield Night at the Discovery Center. This is a tailored event structured for our families where schools are the cultural broker to science engagement. And in that way, we start to shift the language of the home, the language at the school, with partnership and sustained support from the community. And that's how we get kids thinking. Science is for me, math is for me, engineering is for me. How do I take extra classes, Miss G? And then that's when we start to see a higher, more uh, passionate and educated workforce that benefits our community. I look forward to talking about that more on the panel. Thank you so much. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Margaret Mead. That quote is, what is the driving force within, within my own classroom. My name is Genevieve Hubbler, and I teach at Valley View Middle School. I was a dumpster diving 12-year-old. I had a disabled mother, a father who suffered from mental illness, and a brother that had learning disabilities. Life was hard, and school was my safe place. Caring teachers made the difference for me. They were that community. They were that force within my own life. Fast forward 10 years, and I graduated from College of Idaho with Go Yotes. There hasn't been a shout out yet. Woohoo! <laughs> um, I graduated with a double major in edu elementary education and physical education. I graduated as well with an ac as an academic All American, as a Nordic ski racer and was able to have a 3.7 GPA. I have now been in education for 22 years and 20 years at Valley View Middle School. It has been my mission to give back to those that gave to me and to instill that same value within my own students. AVID began in my school eight years ago when I, I took over the program five years ago. There was 113 students in my program when I took it over with a 34% retention rate. Now, five years later, there are 205 students. We've added two sections and we're up to eight sections total. There are nine, we have a 94% retention rate and a waiting list. We have now sent 65 students onto our high school program for AVID and when I took over, we only had 11. AVID has changed the lives at our schools. AVID stands for advancement via individual determination. The key in that is individual determination. It's teaching and inspiring within our own students to find the very best person that they can be. We take average students and, and make them believe that they can be anything. We take students with average test scores that someone might say, eh, you're not good enough for our advanced class. And we say, no, you are good enough and you deserve that spot to be in that rigorous class. And then we give them the tools. We bring in college tutors to help them access their knowledge. We are able to impact um, over 5,000 students last year were impacted by, because of the AVID program. There are five districts within our state that have AVID, 24 secondary schools and eight elementary schools. Of those students, 99% of the seniors completed four-year college entrance requirements. Of those, 94% applied for four-year university and 92% were accepted on. Our program looks at trying to make students believe in themselves. We take an average student and say, you're extraordinary. We help them with those soft skills. We let them know that they are not the person who will be left behind. Just because you might go home to a life where you're looking for the next meal or someone to give you a safe place to care, we are that place to care. We let them believe in themselves and then they can go on to accomplish anything. If, if you are given the opportunity and the opportunity does not come, then you build a door to go through it. That's from Milton Berle. So my challenge to you is help us inspire the next generation and push Idaho to the next step. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Marty Jones. I am the career technical education teacher at Clark Fork High School. Clark Fork is a little tiny school. We encompass a total of 131 students from seventh grade through 12th, all the way up in the panhandle. If this was like a pan, we'd be like a little hole we'd be hanging on the wall. Um, my background is a little bit unique, I guess. I was originally trained as an engineer at University of Michigan. I used to design boats and ships and things like that. I was in a tugboat business. Um, I had 65 employees. I left that, I went to law school. I taught, I was a, a lawyer for a while. Decided I was actually a really good engineer. Went back to doing that. I've had construction companies since then. And the whole gamut, I've been a millionaire and I've been bankrupt. Now I'm a teacher. Five years ago, Clark Fork, which had a, a population of about 135 when I started, dropped down slowly, slowly, slowly until we had just 85 students. And we were losing students in this little, this painfully slow bit of attrition because they were finding that we didn't have what they needed, which is probably characteristic of a lot of little schools. We simply can't have the large programs and all the expanses of things that the big schools have. So we asked Alexa and Siri, and they had nothing for us. So we actually had to put our heads together, and two of the uh, teachers went through and counted all the minutes that we had to comply with for the state, and said, hey, you know what? We can take our Fridays and do something completely different. So now our Friday is what we call the experiential learning tracks. And we have a number of tracks where students get to go out and do different things. The picture you see now, what I do, I do what's called the tech track. They come into my classroom in the morning, my shop. They work on things all day long. They try them out, they break them, they fix them. But it's things they design and put together. We also have tracks where they do um, the arts and crafts. There's a, a culinary arts track. And there's also a track for doing uh, job shadowing. Something like interning, but we um, ship them off to uh, the, the various employers in the community and let them see what the real world is like and what it takes to, you know, to work on the job. It's been quite successful. Our population has gone up, the students are enjoying it, and they're learning from it. This year we've added a new layer to that. We've taken one of our periods and we're on the block schedule and we've created a series of short lessons because it's a lot of investment for a student to decide they want to spend a whole semester doing a particular thing in a track, but if I can give them a snippet of that for a couple of weeks, then they can, say, experience metal casting for two or three weeks. I like metal casting. Okay, let's do that some more in one of my other classes. Or carving with a CNC machine doing things like that, but it gives them a chance to experience a lot of different things in a fairly short period of time to help them make their choices and develop what amount to, this is what I really want to do. And as you all know, if you've been teachers, you find somebody who really likes something, they will learn that material far more easily and more quickly and more thoroughly than, as of when I was a math teacher, trying to pound that math into them and says, no, okay, it doesn't work very well. So we're trying to find those ways. And um, that is what we're about. Thank you very much for your time. Well, I'm Dr. Coyle from Universal Technical Institute. Um, in a previous life, I was a um, I'm retired from public education, 25 years as a um, science teacher, coach, principal, and superintendent. You gave Bill Connors a, a hand for 18 years. <laughs> Thanks, that's better. 25 years, you know, come on. And so I'm, I'm actually starting my, my 40th year in education. Um, so it's, um, it's been an exciting journey all the way through. As I said, I'm the National Director of Counselor and Academic Relations with the UTI. Um, a little bit about us, 
uh, Universal Technical Institute, we're the largest school in the motorsports industry. Uh, we do auto diesel collision, motorcycle, marine, NASCAR, recently have added CNC and welding. Um, we uh, had our beginnings in 1965 uh, in Phoenix, uh, had our first campus and have been going strong since then. We're up to uh, 13 campus locations, including our brand new one that we just opened in Bloomfield, New Jersey. Uh, we have over 200,000 graduates in the field and uh, we're extremely proud of, um, of, uh, of what we do. Um, we do not have a campus here in, uh, in Idaho, which we did, but we don't. Uh, but we do get a lot of students from the Idaho area, um, and we bring them into our campuses and, um, um, and uh, uh, get them trained. Oh, I forgot to get this. That's our locations across the country, so you can see where, where, uh, where we are located. Um, most of the students from here would probably go to, the, to our Phoenix campus. I want to introduce you to... Um, to uh, one of your own. Uh, this is uh, Cheney. Um, Cheney is a, um, uh, a, a very bright, uh, bright and vibrant young man, but Cheney had a problem. Uh, he didn't like high school very much. Uh, he, um, uh, in fact, I think the term that was given to me was he hated high school. I was just trying to be a little bit nicer about it. Um, but he, uh, uh, he's actually from Notice, which is I think about a half hour or so from here. Um, this is my first time to Idaho, but I did look it up. So uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, he, um, uh, he, he was you know, pretty, pretty often skipping school, uh, just not wanting to go to, to, go to classes. Um, he didn't do very well in classes. In fact, he came very close to uh, not graduating. However, he came across UTI, and for once he found something that he loved to do and he found an avenue to get there. He loved to work on cars and thought there, here is, an, here is a, an opportunity. You know, I use the term all the time, your passion can be your paycheck, and I think that is exactly what, uh, what Cheney did, is he turned his passion into a, into a paycheck. And, um, you know, to talk to you a little bit about him, he went on to Phoenix. Um, he um, graduated there after 17 months, uh, he now works for uh, Cummins. He had a 3.9 grade point average at UTI, which is not easy to do, and he had a 98% attendance rate. So it's amazing what happens to someone when they get into their passion of what they want to do. Um, he's 23 years old. I understand he has his uh, brand new truck. Uh, he just built a home, 2,500 square feet on, on three acres. We said one, he said, no, it's three. Uh, three acres. And, um, uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm excited because his mother's here with us. Holly, would you mind to stand up? And, and let's see what a proud mom looks like. You know, there's so many options available to students today. I refer everyone to the rule of 127. I haven't heard that mentioned today. Maybe you don't even know what that is. But the rule of 127 is simply that for every 10 jobs out there, um, one job only requires a master's degree or higher, two jobs only require a bachelor's or higher, but seven jobs out there require competency-based credentials. And I think that's something that we have to look at is the rule of 127. Unfortunately, we're not because we have over 50% of our students are going to four-year schools and almost half of those students are now underemployed. They're not unemployed, but they're underemployed. So it is definitely a problem that we have to deal with. Um, these are our manufacturers that we work with. We feel very strongly in partnerships with industry. We have over 30 alliances with manufacturers, including companies like BMW, Porsche, uh, Cummins, just to name a few. And we feel like that, that uh, what we do works. You know, we, we get our students involved with industry. Um, we get them into the dealerships. We show them what's available to them out there. And our, our motto at uh, UTI is we're changing the world one life at a time, and I really think we are. Thank you. Well, thanks very much to the panel uh, for sharing their insights. Wow, what a what a kind of interesting diversity of approaches 
to the subject we're all here to talk about. It's my pleasure to, to be the moderator of the, the Education Innovation Panel. My name's Skip Oppenheimer. Uh, I'm the, the founding chair of Idaho Business for Education, which was started about, what, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, with about 25 members. We're now, thanks to the leadership of, of Rod and Shauna and uh, our uh, Chair Bob Locken, Andy Scoggins, a lot of other people. There's now 200 uh, business leaders who are members of that organization. And uh, you know, one of the things we're all talking about is how do we connect the dots around some of the needs of all of us as employers and business with education in a more dynamic, more proactive way. And I think thanks to, again, the leadership of an awful lot of the people at the IBE, hopefully we can help be, continue to be a part of that uh, that equation. So it's my pleasure to be here. We've, I will say also that we've worked very closely with the governor. We literally have met with him every month for five or six years, uh, and it's been a true partnership in terms of working together to help develop policy together and to, for us to be a partner in that process. So it's great to be here. I'd like to invite the panel to come back up, and we will get started. Also, I want to remind everybody that we'll have questions coming from you, and we hope we can make this interactive and, and get as many questions going. So please fill out the cards and uh, hold your hand up, and we'll get those questions in front of the group uh, just as soon as you fill those out. Uh, I think we'll start with a few questions to get the ball rolling, uh, and then hopefully we'll get plenty of questions from you all, and then we'll have a, a facilitated discussion uh, at the end of this. I might also just quickly, on a personal level, say my wife Esther is here. She's a licensed counselor and art therapist working with kids over the last, she's retired, but for about 15 years. And one of our kids, our oldest son, is a school teacher. It started in the student teaching about 18 years ago in the Valley View District, uh, teaching second grade, and then moved uh, to the Boise District uh, <clears throat> at about 15 years ago and teaches third grade and still passionate about it. And I will tell you, I go into that classroom and I get totally inspired every time at the work that he and so many thousands of other teachers are doing. So I've got th that personal connection as well. So with that, welcome back to the panel. Uh, we'll start out, let's start out with, with a question for, for the whole group and you can each touch on this. Uh, and Genevieve sort of touched on this to some extent, but when you look at the, the kinds of innovations that you both, or that you all have spoken about, and you're all innovators, what can we learn in terms of what has motivated you all as individuals to be those kinds of innovators in the world of education? And sort of tied to that, are there some ideas in terms of support networks that we could continue to, to develop or to start uh, that might help others to be innovators. Uh, and there are a lot of others, but maybe even more people to be innovators in this world of education. So start with you, Sonia. Hello again. Um, when I think of what inspires me to do, the, to do the work and to seek out different partnerships um, and different relationships within the community to meet the needs of our most vulnerable population, which is who I teach. Uh, the kids and the families continually inspire me. The tenacity that our kiddos have that come from really challenging situations or maybe even war-torn countries, uh, that they are so invested and invested in us as as educators because for those of you who have relationships and know educators, we're not just the teacher, we're the mother, we're the nurse, we're the counselor, we're the kick in the pants sometimes when they need it. Um, and so it's, it's more than just a teacher-kid relationship or just a, a teacher-family relationship. And so I am continually inspired when people that are invested in Boise and invested in our community um, develop partnerships with schools that they see that they have a stake in this thing we call education. That it isn't singularly, that responsibility doesn't singularly fall to one person or one family, is that it is a holistic approach to elevate the situations of some of our families, but also to inspire them. And I mean, I, I mean it when I say we have to 
develop those relationships early and inspire our children early and spark that passion because that's where we set the trajectory for their life of what they're gonna be interested in. And that language of possibility needs to be spoken at all levels in our community, not only business, not only schools, but within the home. And it's that partnership that's inspiring um, that we look and, and try a little harder on how we can meet those goals together. Uh, Carol Dweck did quite a bit of research on the growth mindset, and with that, it's teaching students to, or even adults or workers that you have in your workplace, teaching them to say, I might not be there yet, but I can get there. It's believing in yourself and not saying, not putting limitations on yourself, but pushing yourself to the next spot and seeing the growth and the possibilities, the what if. And so I guess I inspired. I want to instill in, you, in everyone in this room that it's our job and it's our mission to see the potential in people who are with us and then to be able to inspire them to go to that next level. It's creating the relationships and the partnerships that you have out there and it's creating opportunities. Um, for example, two summers ago, several of my students were able to go to a coding camp and that was an opportunity that they had never had before through the STEM Alliance, um, the STEM Action Center. And so we were able to teach students a coding camp. And it was amazing to see these girls who had never sat at a computer before and leave going, I just did coding. And recruiting them was a little difficult, but they made it. And afterward, they were excited. And then they got to have their parents come in and have fancy dinner. And so we ended up actually having um, Texas Roadhouse come in. And so for our students, that was a huge opportunity because we uh, we offered that opportunity for our kids. Our, my students are given opportunities to volunteer at the elementary schools. We run every STEM night, literacy night, carnival night. If you need a workforce of 20 Valley View middle school kids to show up, they know that if they ask, we will be there and we will serve and give back to our community. And so I guess innovation is letting people know that you're willing to work and you're willing to make this place a better better world that we're in and making Idaho a better place. And so my challenge is for you to reach out to schools and as workforce people and say, what can we do to help? And us as teachers, not just closing our classroom doors and deciding that it's within our own small little community, but venturing out and being able to make a difference. So I think I'm going to... Um talk about this a little bit and I'm going to try to wrap up, wrap together what some of the earlier speakers have mentioned with respect to innovation. And at Clark Fork, I mean, you could say, what's that old phrase, uh, necessity is the mother of invention? Well, so is aggravation. Okay, there are a lot of things, you know, that just really bug the daylights out of you. And that's what inspires you to come in and do something different. In our case, you know, as I said, we were having some struggles with how our economics and how our whole, you know, the business of running a school was happening. That was our aggravation. I will agree that we have to have a margin, a period of time where we can get together and talk about these issues and see if we can come up with solutions to them. We have the diversity of thoughts and the diversity of experiences on our staff, even though our staff is small that allows us to bring other ideas that not one individual might have had. We also have the respect for one another as a staff, so that if I'm my idea, and I'm really proud of my ideas, if they, uh, gosh, we don't really like that idea, Marty. Says, oh, that's okay. We will go on and we'll do something else. We also have something that I learned through the martial arts, which is the acronym CAN-I, which is constant, never-ending improvement. And every time we do something, we have to go back and look at it and say, is this, was this done right? Could we do it better? And if we think we can do it better, then as a staff, we commit ourselves to doing it better the next time around. And through that, we have a, a culture that has become nimble. We can sit down and have our, our rather unique staff meetings with only like nine teachers, and we can cover the gamut of all the sorts of things that we do and all the things that we can imagine might be better. We can hash it out and plot a new course. And that's what it looks like for us. You know, I, I think what, um, <clears throat> what inspires me about, about what we do with UTI is like the story of Cheney and, the, uh, and the, the hundreds of other students whose lives that, that um, we've changed. Um, 
At UTI, you, you can't just come to UTI. You have to be invited. You have to go through an interview, and, and we, we ask you a lot of, of questions. You know, what, what was it like for you in high school? What was your attendance like? What's your driving record? All those type of things. We need to know those kind of things because they're going to be going into the work field. We have to know that. But, I, um, but to see people's lives changed, I can remember myself when I was a rep, and I'm from Missouri, I came to a ho home that was actually two trailers welded together. The, the dining room table was one of those big spools like we had in, you know, in college, you know, we used. That was, that was their home. And I interviewed him, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, man, I just couldn't believe it. And a great kid, just super. And the whole family was behind him. Everybody there contributed to his application fee. Everybody there, they bought a big barrel and, and put stuff in there that he was going to need when he went off to UTI. He now works for Thompson GMC Pontiac in Springfield, Missouri. And the last I checked with him, he's making $95,000 a year. That is inspiring. That's what we do. And I think that, you know, changing people's lives, it's, there's, you just can't, you can't put anything on that. It's just, it's, it's pretty amazing to see what happens. And it doesn't just affect that person, it affects their entire family. Thank you. Here's, this is a question from the audience which uh, let me just frame somewhat. I, I think one of the reasons among a bunch that we're all here is how do we take these various ideas in a time of, of rapid, high velocity change and put them together ultimately into a strategy that allows us to move forward as an education system around the, throughout the country and certainly here in Idaho. One of the elements that this question refers to is <clears throat> relates to teacher education, teacher preparation, and standards. Do you, and I'll just open this up to whoever would like to answer it, do you believe that we need to change or modify our teacher education preparation standards, and if so, what changes are needed? Again, this is from the audience. All right. <laughs> um, our colleges of education, they work diligently to prepare our teachers. So, I mean, I got my undergrad and my master's degree from Boise State. I don't know if the Broncos got a shout out already, but there it is again. Um, and I'm actually working on my doctoral degree right now. I'm in my dissertation year, so I'm about up to my eyeballs in uh, College of Education um, here at Boise State. And I know, and I, I mean, I, I teach the methods, science methods class for our pre-service teachers, so I'm very invested and how we prepare our future teachers. Um, I think our courses are rigorous. The standards that we have, um, that, that we apply to new teachers are rigorous. I don't know if there's ever an amount of time or the classes you can take to fully prepare you for what's gonna happen in the classroom and the educators in the room are like, <laughs> word, right? You can't, I mean, you can't fully prepare for everything that you're going to encounter. But the one thing that I do see at Boise State and at other colleges of education is the support network continues, that that outreach into their first year. I know the Boise School District, which I work for, has an excellent mentor program, um, that it is a, a family and that they're never left alone. Um, I, for one, am in favor of high rigorous standards because I have student teachers in my classroom right now who or I hold to a very high standard, the same standard I hold myself to, is that gone are the days where you know, you teach a lesson and you're, you know, you're in at eight and you leave at three. That is not a public educator right now. So public education, <laughs> I take it home, I, you know, I sleep on it, I think on it on the weekends, I'm researching, I'm doing home visits, I'm outreaching, I'm desperately looking for those partnerships in the community to how to best meet the needs of my students. And that's the way we're preparing our teachers now, is it's, it's a calling. It calls to your heart, it calls to your soul. You have no choice, you, you can't leave it if you try, right? Um, but it, my, my heart's invested, and I'm proud that you know, Boise State does an incredible job of instilling that investment. Because um, if you're not willing to give 110%, um, that maybe it's not education isn't the path for you, because that's what it takes. And so that's what I ask of this group that's here. Like, how are you giving to this system where we expect such incredible results, but we need the support? Uh, 
Um, I've been impressed with, I was lucky enough that at the beginning of the school year, our district brought in every new elementary school teacher and as well as all of the kindergarten teachers in our district to do a training on AVID so that we could look at our instructional practices and put into place our best practices. And I was very impressed with the knowledge and the background that this that the new teachers came in. They had the enthusiasm and it was just we as a district, we as a community need to lift them up and help them to have a living wage, help them to be able to instill these values and still be able to raise a family and do things like that. I think it's very important that we are able to continue to give them support on the day in and the day out because it's very much a job where you're on your hip and you've answered a question and then all of a sudden you realize I need to take a time out right now and keep all the other students together while I can talk one-on-one -on -one with a particular student because it's so much about that relationship. Kids don't care until you care. And so it's really important that we give them, give teachers the skills and that support to continue on in the profession. As you might guess, I kind of entered the education profession from a different direction. Um, my family had, I lived in Southern California, moved up to Sandpoint, Idaho, and I uh, was actually still working on Southern California on a dredging business. And when I finally decided, you know what, <laughs> heck with that. I love this place up here. What am I going to do? And I read in the newspaper that the science teacher who had been at Clark Fork, Idaho for 26 years was retiring. And it gave me the idea that, oh, I would love to teach science. That was my favorite thing when I was a kid. But I don't have to go back to school for it. So there were alternative routes. And I took one of those. So that summer, I, I passed a series of tests you know, on um, physics and biology and uh, general practical teaching knowledge and things like that. And, and uh, I talked to the principal at Clark Park. They hired me. I don't know what they were thinking. And I, in September, I walked into the classroom for the first time as a teacher, and they just throw me off to the wolves. And it's been quite an experience. You know, my first year, I would say, was, well, the chart really didn't go down that low. It was really, really rough, but I put the hours in. And now I'm realizing that the background that I have is actually in many ways it's ideal, particularly for a technology teacher, because I'm cross-trained in a lot of things through my experiences. I have, um, I've repaired hydraulic systems, I've repaired electrical systems, I, I've done welding, I've done you know, machine work, I've done navigation, I was training to be a pilot at one point. I, I know my way through the law, okay? And all of those experiences have made me look at every new opportunity or new problem as something that I can solve that. And in my view, more cross-training, particularly on the technical side of things, is going to benefit teachers. If you are one of these linear people, like, it's not a bad example. My wife is a physical therapist. She decided in high school she wanted to be a physical therapist. She went through college to be a physical therapist. She's been a physical therapist ever since. And that's all she knows. You know, and it's made her very happy. But if something happened to the physical therapy profession, which it actually is now, then she would be lost. So I really, I'm a big believer in cross training, um, as many a diverse array of subjects as you can handle. The math is good, the science is good, the English is essential. I think the key is to get industry involved with your with the schools and with the teachers. Um, you know, I don't care if you go to Boise State, MU, KU, what's the matter you, I don't care where you go. You can't, you can't be prepared totally for what you're going to face in the classroom. She said it very well. And um, I, can, I can remember my, my theory classes. I'm going, wait a minute, this wasn't the way it's supposed to go, but, but this is how it went down. But, but I think that teachers need help. You know, it was mentioned earlier that, you know, we, we can't, you know, we can't educate your students, you know, all by ourselves. We have to have that help. And getting industry involved, that's something at UTI, we, we get in, uh, we promote that very strongly. Getting, getting them into the high schools, getting them uh, involved. You know, they've got resources that you don't have available to you. 
they have equipment, things that they can help you with. Uh, and so anything like that can help you then to, to actually become a better teacher. And maybe pick, let's pick up on that theme because it ties to a couple, maybe three questions that have come from the audience uh, and kind of pick up on Steve's point about connecting with industry. As, as a, and if we, let's try to shift to think, you know, five years from now, and, and one of the goals, I think, of this conference and others that America Succeeds is doing is what are some common themes that we can all learn from that allow us to develop strategies that move education forward in a way that responds to some of the needs of the changes we've all been talking about and the needs that are out there for our students, both as employees but also as good, good citizens. Uh, but, but talking to that point about connecting with industry, one of the questions is that the, one of the people in the audience said that they feel there is a disconnect between industry and the education system when it comes to educating our youth. Do you see potential for industry to be more involved, helping to direct curriculum towards the types of learners they need, providing technology at younger ages to provide opportunity earlier? And just generally, let me just pose the question, how would you recommend, and particularly looking out over the, what would look different five years from now in terms of connecting industry and the needs of employers in a more dynamic way with the schools, you as teachers and uh, students? Well, I, um, one of the things I, I um, <clears throat> think is key is, and I've, I felt like UTI, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that UTI has been guilty of is that we've waited until uh, students are like uh, their juniors and seniors. And there's where we need to get to the kids, right there at the elementary and middle school levels. Um, and we need to offer programs for them. Like one of the things that we do, we, we're the national sponsor of the Junior Hot Rodders of America. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's pretty cool. They built their, their little drag racers and they work on these um, little Briggs and Stratton motors. And we help to facilitate that. And then what we will do, we'll have events where we go into a community and we invite one middle school or one elementary school to come in with their 80, 90, or 100 kids, how many they have, and then they get to participate that day in, in, that, in that program. But I think we need to plant those seeds early with, uh, with those kids and, and find that passion that's, that's there already. You know, we just need to cultivate it a little bit. And, um, and then offer the, the, uh, the teachers the opportunities, uh, like what we do is we offer professional development for teaching groups. I go all over the country and do that. I've been to, uh, you know, probably 20 different states doing different types of professional development where we bring industry in and we show the teachers. It's one thing to tell them, hey, it's out there, but teachers won't, they, they need the guidance. And so we actually bring the industry in and show them how they can partner, introduce them. And the next thing you go, you know, you've got a, you've got a pretty good marriage going there where they get excited and, and work together with each other. So I am a um, CTE teacher. For those of you who don't know, CTE stands for Career and Technical Education. And the CTE program in Idaho requires us as a part of our program to have uh, kind of a partnership with local industry. Yeah. Yeah. Got that? <laughs> and so I have, and I'm still developing an advisory board with people from the local industry who will come in and help me, you know, talk about my curriculum and opportunities they have to create that link and, you know, reinforce the interface between what I do and what they need. And it's, um, it's something that I think probably could be expanded elsewhere and, you know, different aspects like if you were in the English program or something like that. Well, okay, talk with somebody in a law office. Have them, you know, what sort of English, you know, how precise do you have to be when you're talking about things? You know, or the science department, you know, talk with your medical people in the area. But with CT, they, we already have a program for that, and it's, uh, I think it could be really, really helpful. And Clark Fork, you know, if we, do, if we limit ourselves to just that, we'd have primarily loggers. Nothing wrong with loggers. Now, we have a lot of people doing some amazing things, you know, but Sandpoint, which is not too far away, also has a big aerospace industry. I don't know if most of you are aware of that. But we build airplanes up in Sandpoint. And so part of my goal is to expand into from what I do and add an aerospace program. 
because I need to reach them and my students need to be able to experience flight in some way or other. I think all of us are huge proponents of the industry and business connection. And of course, we see that there is space all the way from the littles, the elementary that I teach, all the way through uh, you know, post high school level. The one thing when, Skip, when you talked about where would we see this in five years, if I could wave a wand, is that it would be um, industry and business have a more, um, a richer relationship with schools and our neediest communities, of course. I'm biased towards Title I schools with some of our neediest kids, but how do we develop those relationships early, recognizing that sometimes it's a pebble in the pond. We're not going to see the outcome of closing the gap for our STEM fields until we develop a relationship with the younger kids and with those families. So I, I mentioned in my rapid fire introduction that Discovery Center of Idaho and Garfield are working all year long together. We're front loading, they're at our STEM nights, we're providing support, we're engaging engaging the families, we're doing a facilitated event, we're following up, we're finding a way to get the funding to bring the families back, all for the goal of shifting identity. Science is for me, math is for me, this is fun. So then when I send my students to her and they are in the AVID course and they're like, I could take a harder math class, I could take a more advanced science class because it became a part of my habitus, something that was intrinsic in me that was developed early on. So I would love to see uh, outreach within our own community. Boise is that we're bringing our elementary kids into your facilities. Let them see, demystify some of these spaces, right? That they see that, oh, this is a thing. People work here and this is a potential job. Also, it was as was mentioned, come out, do outreach into the schools to where they see the job potential the, not only for the, you know, the paycheck of it, but that people live their passions and people speak and engage in their passion that it's possible for them at wh whatever walk of life and whatever zip code they belong to, that their passions are possible right here in Boise. I would also say that it's super important that we continue to just change the culture and it's a cultural shift between it's, it, I love this opportunity to be together because it's that cultural shift of how can we together pull our minds and come up with solutions. Um, the innovation, the world is gonna be a different place. And so we have to teach our students to critically think and problem solve, create opportunities for them. And so as educators, I think we're open to those opportunities and we would love to see you guys sitting at the table with us, being involved with us, um, coming into our classrooms. I need a guest speaker often on Friday. So anyone who would like to come be a guest speaker in my classroom, I would love that because we have career days and things like that. And sometimes it's just knowing names of people to bring in to work with our students. I mean, I think picking up on that theme, there, there, you know, the individual experiences the four of you've had in very different ways, I think are, are, are helpful, very helpful to this process. If we now think about things in a more strategic way or not more strategic but in a strategic way if and there's a question from the audience if you could wave a magic wand what one barrier would you remove to allow teachers to be more innovative in their classroom in other words what barriers prevent or limit innovation in our system today and what's one suggestion each of you would make if you could wave a magic wand just one barrier <laughs> pick one. Hold on. Uh, let me pick a big one then. Uh, the, the bureaucracy of uh, do we have liability insurance to do this? Can I take them down to, you know, by the river to do some water sampling? Who's going to fall in the river? Um, it, which it happens when they're 10. Um, so, I mean, just the bureaucracy of all the, the, the logistics of the why not and it's too hard and what about the buses, oh, the, the scheduling of the buses because we've gotta be back because English starts 50 minutes later or whatever. If I could wave a wand, I would remove the, just the, the, the bureaucracy of uh, the permission slips and buses and just let us do what we know we need to do. Stop fretting that the next class starts 50 minutes later. We've got, we've got insurance, you know, we're public schools, we've got it covered. Let us get out into the community. Let us actually partner with people, you know, get us back to school when we get back to school and let us do the work that we know we need to do to develop these relationships and start shifting that identity for these kids. Where, and just to pick up on that, where does that come from, do you think? Is that at the building? 
building level? Is that at the school district, school board le district level? Yes. Is it <laughs> okay. Good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Next. Uh, let me add um, some of that with particular regard to small schools and career and technical education. The, um, my original approach to CT was to create an engineering or pre-engineering program. And if I had a position in a school with uh, two or 3,000 students, I could probably fill a class with students who wanted to become engineers. I have a school instead with you know, about 90 high schoolers. I might get one. That doesn't make a satisfying or useful program. I, I then added uh, welding to my endorsements so I can teach some welding classes. That expanded things. And I'm pursuing, a, I have a temporary endorsement for doing technical education, which gives me another 30 or 40 classes that I can teach. The point is for a small school, it's really, really tough, and I'd say probably impossible, to choose a particular technical field and have this linear path that will allow them to achieve a certificate level experience by the time they're through with that class, by the time they, they graduate. It just won't be successful because the numbers won't be there. My approach is to give them a smorgasbord. I can't take them all the way through, but I can help them decide what they want to do. And by giving them lots and lots of choices and lots and lots of ways to experience it, they can slowly refine in their own minds what their future is going to look like. And I think the, there are a few tweaks that need to be made to the system, which is probably the state and, and probably the federal level, that will allow that sort of or encourage that sort of diversity of opportunity. I'm going to be pretty bold here. Um, if I could wave one thing away, it would be the closed-mindedness of many educators. And what I mean by that is, I think if you are an educator, if you truly are an educator, you want to open up your student to uh, open up opportunities for, for your students, all opportunities. Um, we actually have school districts across the country that uh, will not let us come in and speak to their students uh, for one reason or another. Um, they, uh, they, you know, they, they don't want their kids that, that, well, our kids all go to so-and-so, uh, community college or our kids all, all do this. So we really don't need this kind of thing. And I really think that's sad because it's taking a point, you know, going back to Cheney again. Um, I had, I had a young man come in, uh, I was at our campus in Dallas and um, we were having a counselor group there. It was the, it was the Fort Worth ISD. And, um, uh, and th this boy, he was getting ready to graduate. And he came in and, and um, he kind of let him have it. He said, you know, I almost missed this opportunity because I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to hear about it. And so I think that as educators, we have a, we have a duty to, to uh, show, show our kids all opportunities. We don't know you know, for sure. I, I always use the term when I speak to everybody, I say, what's the one question that we ask all young people? What is it? What do you want to be when you grow up? Why do we quit asking that question? Why, when they become a junior or senior, we, just, we think, oh, they know. Why do we quit asking the question? I ask counselors that all the time. When's the last time you ask your senior in your office, say, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'll get off my soapbox now. My wife asked me that too, <laughs> day before yesterday. Um, I also want to thank um, organizations that do have opportunities where you can apply for grants and you are able to have days like STEM days at our school where Discovery Center of Idaho does come out with the bus where we do have times where we have people taking off and coming in. The barrier that gets into our way sometimes is just the time for logistics, the time to organize all of those parts because on top of already teaching 180 students in a day, it's also my job to continue to go ahead and try to organize this particular activity and spend my free time on this. And so sometimes it's just that time or someone to say, hey, I've got this, because it's wonderful when we can go to a college campus and 
go to U of I and do a, uh, the U of I campus here in Boise that has a STEM day. That is a great opportunity for us where they bring in college professors for us. But it's nice when those days are already planned ahead for us because then we don't have to deal with as many of the logistics part of that. Hey, Skip, really quick, that, and thank you for mentioning the a thank you to the people who provide uh, grant supports and foundation support to be able to do these things. Funding is a thing, and I know that's you know news to all of you, right? Funding and education is a thing. But to do the extras, so for the industry and the business in the room, if, if you're gonna extend the opportunity for us to come out, throw in 80 bucks for the bus. That makes my job, our job, a lot easier for to sell it to our principals. So I mean, the, the small tokens of funding mean a lot to us to make it a possibility. All right, we, I was just notified we have three minutes left and we have time for one last question and several questions from the audience related to this question of, of a four-year degree, the perception that that was sort of the gold standard, uh, the feeling now that a one-year certificate, a two-year associate, that there are so many, there are other paths that lead to very satisfying, important careers today. How do you feel, and we'll have to make this relatively quick, we're, how do you think we're doing as an educational system in getting that message, if you think that message is correct, out to students? I can speak for the Boise School District that we're doing a great job promoting our tech center and different paths to post high school education. My father was a migrant worker in Southern Arizona. He has an eighth grade education, more education than any of his other 12 brothers and sisters, one generation away from his sacrifice, knowing how important education was. That was gospel in my house. I'm getting my dissertation, my doctoral degree, one generation away from a migrant worker in Southern Arizona picking cotton. Thank you. That's a thanks to him. I'll tell him you <laughs> gave him an applause. But the point I'm saying is that speaking that language of possibility and saying that there are multiple paths and there is honor in every work path you choose, but let it be your choice and not a default because you don't have the education to pursue your passion. So I think the more language and opportunities for those possibilities we give, and I know the Boise District is doing everything they can to promote those different paths. Um, with AVID, it's really important that we're looking at college and career readiness. And so for me, it's I think it's so important that we just continue to give them opportunities and to look at, you know, what can we be and to imagine. And it may not fit 100%, but we're gonna give you all the academics and the foundational knowledge that is required. And then we're gonna teach you those soft skills to go out and pursue the next dream to create the next vehicle. We sat with a student a week ago and talked with him and he's matured so much and grown so much and pointed out to him and he, that he was going to be a, you know, you have the potential to actually be a valedictorian. Do you realize that if we care about you, and he was a student who was underachieving two years ago, do you realize if you keep pushing harder, you don't, and we said, what do you want to do? And he said, well, I'm not sure. I might be able to just work for my family's business. And we said, and, and they happen to make, be mechanics, which is a fabulous career, but we said to him, but what about the possibilities? Could you be the next person to create the Tesla? Can you be the next person who can create the next rocket, the next whatever? And he was like, you really believe that we can do this? And a lot of it is they just need to hear that. Well, there are four-year degrees and there are four-year degrees. And I don't think that you should treat them all the same. My job as a high school teacher is to give them what I call the bag of tools. All the things they should need, all the things they can use, so whatever course that ends up suiting them the best, they can pursue that. And if they want to be a doctor, if they want to be an engineer, you know, if they want to be a, you know, go to UTI and become an exceptional auto mechanic and, you know, take force to victory again. <laughs> you know, but it's my job to prepare them to be capable, regardless of how they choose. As I said before, I go all over the country and speak to counselor groups and, and administrator groups and uh, CTE groups and uh, all, all these. And I think we're making progress. But, you know, I'm from Missouri. you got to show me. And, uh, I, uh, uh, and I get lip service. But then I see it, it's still not happening completely. We still have. And I, and I really think because whenever I talk, especially to counselors, they all ask me the same question. What can I do about my parents? 
because the parents are so ingrained that, hey, you're going to get a college degree. And I'm not, you know, I, I talked to, um, I didn't catch her name, but I, I talked to, to you uh, earlier because I don't even like to use the word college. I use the word post-secondary. Uh, college pigeonholes everything. And it, I just like to use post-secondary education. So I think it's getting better. I do. And I think there's some districts like what you're describing there, I think get it. But there's some districts that don't. And um, we, we just have to continue to work on it to, uh, to educate uh, that, that there are all types of possibilities out there. Very good. Well, great panel. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for all the good work that you're doing.